Good morning, church. I am hoping that um, the words as I speak them, as the Lord has given, that um, to be received and to make sense and impact on our life today. I pray in Jesus' name. It's my first time speaking in Christ Church, and um, <laughs> when I was asked to do it, I thought, I don't think I'm able to. And um, <laughs> I think if you made uh, a joke of it the other day, <laughs> it says, I'm sure you're the one that prayed that the marathon will make them close the road so you don't have to speak. <laughs> well, the Lord has his own way, though, you know, for a short while we thought the road would be closed and there would be no service. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, I'll just hop to the next church. <laughs> but God has his own way and his ways are not us. So we thank God for this morning. Um, the topic I'm going to cover this morning is a topic that um, is very dear to my heart. Um, as a woman, as a mother, so I pray that we touch on it in a way that we will live here and be able to do something different from what we're doing about this topic. Um, it came up because um, I felt so touched and so, you know, worried about it that even in looting here, children, uh, there was an attempted adoption, uh, you know, abduction of children, and some are still, well, at least one girl is still missing as we speak. Um, and um, it feels as if we don't talk about it. It's not our child, so it doesn't matter. It's not happening in our household, so it's okay. But as Christians, I don't think the Lord has given us that, you know, luxury to just put hands in our ears and say, well, it doesn't affect me. Um, I was thinking about, kind of prepared everything I want to say. But then this morning, as the Lord always does his own thing, his own way, brought it home in a different light. The Bible verse that was sent this morning for me to have a look at, Hebrew 13 verse 3. It says, remember those who are in prison as though you are in prison with them. And those who are mistreated treated since you also are in the body. I started yesterday by talking to my, telling my daughter, Amy, what I was going to talk about and said I'm talking about um, abduction of children and human trafficking and domestic violence. I just want to wrap all of them together in one. And I said, well, I'm looking at it from the angle that people are thinking, what has that got to do with us? And she went, yeah, what has it got to do with you? None of your children have been adopted anyway. I said, yeah, that's true, but... A um, few years ago, my big, my, one of my daughters, Fego, the one that plays basketball, she goes to Southampton. She's just finished from there. She goes to play basketball in Limano every day after school. <laughs> this is a child before she will not get out of bed, but then when she started playing basketball, you couldn't stop her from going to basketball. So she goes there, comes back every evening after school, sometimes late, you know, during the winter. But then one day she noticed that um, a man is following her. She comes home and says, Mom, I don't think, I don't know, but this, there's this car, it's always behind me. 
and I said, okay, maybe it just looks like the same car. It's not you. They follow in. Just keep walking. So she was on the phone. And then after a while, the man now starts stopping to ask her, oh, where are you going? Can I give you a lift? I'm like, just keep walking. Ignore him. So she came home. And this thing kept happening. And one day, she, the man stopped and was talking to her. I wouldn't go. And she phoned me. It's not that far from my house. And I said, okay, just keep walking. Pretend as if she don't notice him. I'm coming. So I drove down. I drove down the road to meet her. And the man, you know, kind of turned, went into a side road, into the corner shop, as if she's going to buy something. He went in there. When I got there, he went in walking around as if he's looking at something. And I went to him and I said, look, mister, stop following my daughter. I've got your number. I'm giving it to the police. And the next time you follow him, I will call the police to pick you up. I know your number now. So please, stop it. Oh, I wasn't following her, but you just spoke to her. I said, so stop. You know, when it's dark in winter, it gives you the chill to know that somebody is following your child. So now, when I hear of children that have been dragged into vans that turn up dead, they might have just been playing. And now they're gone. But you know... As a society today, the British society, we have this thing. Well, it's not, that's not me they're slapping. You see somebody being beaten on the street. It's not me. You see somebody that is being kicked and dragged into a van. It's not my child. When is it going to mix, you know, make us, our body a blood boil to want to say, hey, mister, what is going on? Leave that woman alone or leave that girl alone. What is happening today? These children that have been taken are not just being left in loot, you know, in the UK here. Some are being taken out of the country to become prostitutes, making money for some people. Martin said to speak about this because when I prayed about it, that it felt it's something that touched my heart. So when he said to speak about it, I was looking at it. I said, okay, I can't just come here, stand for 20 minutes and talk about it's not right that they're doing this thing. What does the Bible say we shall do as Christians? Is it right for us to say something? Or should we just sit down and watch? Psalm 82, verse 3 to 4 tells us what to do. I'm reading it from the message version because I kind of like the way they get to the point and brings the English home to us so we can understand what they say. From verse 3, it says, you are here to defend the defenseless. To make sure that underdogs get a fair break. Your job is to stand up for the powerless. And prosecute all those who exploit them. So your job, our job, is to stand up for that child that have no one to defend them. Our job is to look beyond that person that is standing by the roadside begging for money. Look beyond the woman that when you say something, they are jumping. Why are they jumping? What is the story behind their jumping? The woman that, you know, you see 
going by the roadside and when anything happens, they behave as if, you know, you're going to kill them. There is a story behind that woman. I had a woman in front of me recently as I start my counseling, you know, career, if you call it that, who came to me and sat in front of me just broke down crying before she starts saying what her issues are. She breaks down crying. And I'm looking, thinking, what is it behind this woman's story? And then she opens her mouth. 30 years of domestic violence. 30 years. Can you imagine that? Being in slavery. That is slavery. For 30 years. And thank God for the government this, at the moment. If you hear a woman that is going through that kind of problems, every day they're screaming in their house, they're punching them, she don't have to give evidence. You can call the police. Something can be done for that person. She don't have to do anything. The police can come and look into the issues. Even if she don't want to speak, no, she don't have to. They can listen to what you say. So you are doing something. You know, the first thing is educate yourself to know that there are laws in the land. And the other thing we must do as Christians is pray. You say, what, what will my prayer do? It will not do anything. Yes, it will do something. Prayer changes things. It might not happen straight away, but it sure will happen. I had a friend that was going through domestic violence and she wouldn't talk about it. You know, I'm talking about children that have been abducted on the streets. But people go to other countries to marry women and bring them to this country. Now, one thing a domestic violent perpetrator does very well is kind of take you away from those you can talk to. Take you away from your comfort zone. So if you don't have no one to cry to, you are isolated. You are in prison in the so-called home that you've been married into. Now, when God created, he says he created the man and the woman. See, this God we serve is a God that um, is not partial. Yeah, so I, I listened to a preacher recently say that, oh, God's ultimate plan was to create the man. The woman was not in his plan. So we, you know, don't sit in meetings with our husbands and then when your husband speaks, you say, I don't believe what he says. But God that created from the beginning, Genesis, says he created the woman and the man. And he created them in his image. When Adam saw Eve, he was so happy. He said, this is bone of my bone. And the Bible says that, you know, they became one flesh. Now, how can you take a woman that you say is your flesh, bring them from wherever you go and marry them from, and start beating up on them. Trying to prepare for this. I watched a video of a lady in America that this husband beat her so much, poured petrol on her and burned her. And her skin even beat her even at that point that 
She couldn't walk again. She had to go through rehabilitation. And now when all these kind of things were happening, slowly people were there, but nobody said anything. Nobody spoke until this girl had to now go through rehabilitation, learning how to walk. She made a video thanking God for bringing her thus far. She says she cried even now, but now she cries tears of joy because she has not died. I think the first um, scripture that I opened when I was looking at this, so not as I was reading for the week, Jeremiah was just there every minute. And Jeremiah 22 from verse 1, it sends a warning out to the rulers. It says, God's order, go to the royal palace and deliver this message. Say, listen to what God says, O king of Judah. You who sit on David's throne, you are, you and your officials, and all the people who go in and out of these palace gates. This is God's message. Attend to matters of justice. Set things right between people. Rescue victims from their exploiters. Don't take advantage of the homeless. The orphans, the widows, stop the murdering. And it goes on to say that there is punishment if we don't do something. So now I look at those things and I kind of say, what can we do? Seriously, we need to start taking note of things that are going on around us. We need to start being our sister's keeper. Let's not be <laughs> like, you know, Cain. When the Lord asked him, Cain, where is your brother? What did he say to the Lord? Am I my brother's keeper? Please, let's be our brother's keeper. Let's not turn, you know, turn the other way. If we decide to turn the other way and lock our ears, then we are not doing what the Lord has ordered us to do. James talks about, in the book of James, talks about religion that is pure, undefiled before God. He said that religion is the religion that, you know, you visit those who are suffering. That undefiled religion is looking at your brother or your sister suffering and asking yourself, what can I do? Not saying to your sister or your brother that is suffering, oh, it is well with you. The Lord will do something. And you just turn the other way and go or you see a child that, you know, every day, there's a child we used to have in the primary school where my children used to go to. How can you give a child a jumper that just come out of the washing, that is not dry in this country? Well, it was okay. People were looking and, you know, turning the other way. That was wrong. 
why don't you dry this child? Oh, I did tell him to wash it in the night time, and he didn't do it. A primary school child, how old were you when you start washing your own? But it was okay. Everybody was looking the other way. We can't keep going until the child dies and we think, oh, it's okay. I want to encourage us today as a church to stand for the oppressed. To stand for the woman that is crying out. Even though they're not saying the word, the way they go about their lives tells a story. You know, domestic violence, we think about, you know, the bruises on the face. No, that's not all of it. There is mind games. It turns a strong woman into a very weak person. There is spiritual abuse as well. It's all there. It's part of it. When the woman that God has put in your life, that should be, both of you should be enriching each other, becomes the one that you will make remarks about, oh, she knows nothing. Then you are going against what God said you should do. You are to love the other person as if you're loving yourself. If you actually love yourself, <laughs> if you are walking along the street and you start hitting yourself, what will people call you? Isn't that a mad person? So, if you are actually belittling the woman in your life, belittling the man in your life, because this is not only just you know, a woman issue, or even belittling the child that God has put in your care. Remember, they are God's children. You are just a caretaker. Love them like the Father said we should. So we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Remembering, let's bring it home. Remembering the girl from Luton here that is missing. Two of them went away and one is back. That wherever she is, that the Lord will protect that child and bring her home. I look at those stories and I think about, I have four girls. What, what if it was mine? As the book of Hebrew that I just touched on this morning says, Let's think of them as if they are our own. So let's pray this morning. I'm going to bow our head and I'm going to please ask at least two or three of you if you feel led to pray for the girls that are missing, the ones that have been abducted. There are children that have been even killed as they were taken away. You know, Let's pray. Pray for the children. Pray for the women. Pray for the men that are suffering. That healing. 